One other trial that I'd like to speak to both of you about, and Courtney, I think you were referring to it. I think it was the one that was published in JAMA. This is the TREAT trial. I think that's the one that you were referring to. And I mentioned Ethan Wise uh, earlier, who was included in that New York Times piece. He seems to have been convinced that there's no benefit to, to TRE, and this was his trial. Uh if my memory serves me correctly, it was a 12-week intervention. It was comparing a, a TRE group. It wasn't early TRE uh, versus a group that was given some advice around structuring meals over the course of a day. They seemed to, to find no significant difference in, in weight loss. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this trial and, and what it does tell us, what it doesn't tell us? Yeah, absolutely. So they were comparing eating three meals a day. That's what the control group did. And the control group was required to eat breakfast every day versus effectively skipping breakfast, starting eating at 12 p.m. and finishing eating at 8 p.m. And they found no benefit for weight loss. And also participants lost a little bit of lean mass, though it wasn't an amount that we would consider clinically significant. So I think, I mean, this is where it's really important to look at all of the research that's been done on meal timing. So there are a bunch of, about a handful of studies out of Japan that have done these very carefully controlled studies where they compare eating three meals a day versus uh, skipping breakfast and eating two meals a day. And in all of those studies, they find that skipping breakfast and then, you know, eating um, at lunchtime and at dinner time that that actually raises glucose levels across the day. So at least in the short term, you know, the data we have on on uh, glycemic control suggests that actually skipping breakfast and eating two meals is worse. Now, in their particular study, you know, this is where you start asking questions of like, okay, they're eating in a shorter duration, um, but they're also eating significantly later in the day. They weren't necessarily moving um, um, both, you know, breakfast a little later and dinner a little earlier. And in fact, if you actually dig really deep in that, in that paper, you'll actually find that the group that did time-restricted eating starting to go to bed later. So this is suggesting they're eating significantly later in the day. So I suspect they didn't find an effect in any endpoint just because we know that there have been studies that show if you tell people eat meals at regular times, um, that that actually improves their uh, cardiovascular health um, mm -hmm. and their metabolic health. So, right. So again, the control group is not a no intervention group. It's definitely an intervention group. And in fact, some of the benefits of time restricted eating may be due to fasting duration, some due to the time of day, and then some do the regularity of meals. So when I think about meal timing studies, I think about all those different aspects and how they interact together. So you just have to consider them, you know, um, together. So my suspicion is because they forced the control group to eat so much earlier in the day, that may have wiped out any benefits from time-restricted eating. I don't know if Emily will agree with me, but that's my take on that. Yeah, today. no, I agree with those points. And, and one thing I wanted to bring up, so that same group from Israel, from Oren Foray's group, um, you know, they did a lot of really interesting work on timing of eating. And, and we've mainly been talking about duration, but the phase, which is kind of getting it early or late, like what time of the day you eat, the regularity of when you eat, so how much variability you have, as well as the frequency of when you eat. You know, are you eating 16 times a day? Are you eating three times a day or two times a day? All of those things are timing of eating and all of those things affect health. Um, and their group also has shown really nice studies showing that if you're just skipping a meal, if you skip breakfast, you do have a higher glucose response to your first meal in the afternoon, just like, you know, Courtney had kind of mentioned. So again, I think that is one, one big part of it. Um, and it's something really important to think about when you are trying to figure out the right schedule for you. I think regularity of, of eating time. Um, and, you know, even in our studies where they did have a regular eating window, we actually saw that their sleep um, started to become more regular as well. Like it does seem mm. like there's this kind of downstream effect. Um, the other issue that I have um, with a JAMA paper from Ethan Weiss's group is half of the participants were done remotely where they never actually met with the clinic. They were able to sign up online. Um, which is a great way for reaching out to different populations. But with every pro like that, you have a con as well, in which case, if you actually look at the adherence, the people who did respond had a pretty high adherence, but only about 24% of the responses that they would have expected came in. So there was a lot of unknown of if people were actually doing the intervention itself. And they had half of the participants who did come into the clinic and they saw better results yeah. than those who didn't come in. And so I think whenever you're doing a behavioral intervention, 
they're usually pretty intensive. You know, if you look into caloric restriction or other dietary interventions, they frequently entail having like support groups where you have to come in and talk about it and all these other things to be able to get that. And it, that never happens in time restricted only studies. The only times I've seen it are really when you have it um, like in these last two papers that paired it with caloric restriction or with Courtney's work where they're actually coming in and eating with you. But even then it requires a lot of work to get that. So without giving as much interaction with the participants, time restricted eating has actually seen pretty similar results, which I think is pretty shocking in its own right. But if you don't have any interaction with your participants, I don't think any behavioral intervention, you would really expect to see much of a change. So again, I think that's a pretty big caveat to that finding. And it's important to keep in mind the other thing I'd like to say just for looking at any time restricted eating study is many of them don't even look at what the eating window is at baseline. <laughs> Luckily, more, that's become more common, but that's kind of like saying we're going to do caloric restriction, but I don't know how many calories you eat right now. Mm. Like, what are you comparing it to? Right. And so I think the quality of, of papers has, has gone up a lot. And I think this field was trying to figure out what it was exactly and, and take those things into consideration. But some of the papers that don't find any findings also did not really document when they were eating very well, or it was just on a survey after the fact um, on self-reporting, which are, are pretty big caveats to know when someone is actually eating. And it, it makes it hard to test the mm -hmm. efficacy of the intervention itself. Yeah. And I just want to build on one thing you said, right? So kind of buried in the manuscript, the, the, they had half of the participants come in for their assessments in person. And those who came in for their assessments in person, there was a statistical trend towards an improvement in weight loss. So yeah, go figure. Okay. <laughs> right? The participants who actually got yeah. a little more handholding or touch actually were more adherent and lost a little more weight.